In a pop culture landscape that feels increasingly bogged down by stale remakes, franchise revivals, and lackluster film sequels, there's still a beacon of hope for the future. Indie animation. Firmly separating itself from mainstream films and TV, indie animation includes film productions, web series, and short films being produced by small, independent teams. Traditionally, this category has included such veteran animators like Ralph Bakshi and Don Bluth, who both left larger animation companies to work on their own projects. But today, I'm talking more about the current evolution of indie animation, uh, particularly with its wide accessibility through the internet. If you're as terminally online as I am, then you've certainly come across posts about upcoming animated pilots or a Kickstarter campaign to get a new series up and running. The amount of talented people creating their own ambitious projects is staggering. With a ton of momentum and passion, behind works like Lackadaisy, The Amazing Digital Circus, and Monkey Wrench shining through in the quality of their work. Now, the timing could not be better for indie animation to shake things up and start edging into Hollywood's turf, mostly because the industry as a whole has been extremely hostile to animation lately. Canceled projects for tax write-offs, corporate meddling, worker strikes, plus jobs being eliminated or drastically cut back due to the advent of AI. It's a tough landscape out there for any animator to survive in. But during this massive slump, many of them are redirecting their focus towards working on indie projects for greater creative freedom and flexibility. But why has this push been so noticeable online? What changed to make a formerly niche hobby into a viable animation industry competitor? Has it become more popular than what Hollywood is providing these days? And how sustainable is indie animation as we know it now? Well, we'll get into all that here shortly. But before we start, a quick word from this video sponsor. So in case you're new here and did not know, I watch a lot of animated stuff on this channel. But I frequently run into the problem of not being able to access certain movies or shows because, you guessed it, they're region locked. <laughs> Land of the free my ass. Whenever a new Bluey episode is released, I gotta wait for it to arrive on Disney Plus long after the Australian premiere. Unless... That's right, I'm going to a land down under with NordVPN. I switch my location to Australia, jump over to ABC iView, and just like that, it's wholesome doggy family time. No, Bluey, no. That's how they say it, no. Uh, by the way, this applies to most region locked areas. Is there anything from Japanese Netflix that you want to watch? Well, NordVPN will help you unlock the most inner depths of your weeaboo soul. And all of this is done not at the expense of your own online security. Uh, sitting at home like a bum? Hey, me too. NordVPN cares. Traveling the world like a crazy nomad? NordVPN cares. And don't even get me started on the passwords you'll need to get into these sites. I'm embarrassed to say, but I've been using the same password for almost all of my logins since the dawn of time. This kind of habit can leave you exposed to password attacks. It only takes a hacker one lucky shot to have access to everything at that point. And trust me, you do not want to be in that situation. I've been there, but that was before Nord. By utilizing NordVPN's dark web monitor, they can alert you to websites that have been compromised. Did you make a Sony PSN account recently? <laughs> like you had a choice. Well, NordVPN will let you know when that data leaks. Then you can use NordVPN's password manager and let them recommend strong passwords that will ensure your online security from here on out. It matters not if you're in your room of stink or at your local coffee shop. The internet can leave you vulnerable unless you're wearing your NordVPN threat protection jacket to protect you from the chills of internet insecurities. No more pesky ads or malware to contend with when you're just simply trying to stay in your lane. All in all, internet privacy and security is of the utmost importance. No one else is really doing it for us. So having NordVPN by our side is just the online guardian angel that we need. I use it every day. And I believe that it will improve your online browsing experience as well. So get on over to nordvpn.com/saberspark 
to get my exclusive NordVPN deal with an additional four months extra. It is risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So you all have a chance to test this out for yourselves to see if you really enjoy it. I highly recommend Nord. Thanks to them for sponsoring this video. And on that note, back to the world of indie animation. All right, back to the video. To reiterate, indie animation is a term referring to independent animated productions, usually produced by either one person or a small team or company. They usually range from things like short cartoons or music videos to something larger scale, like a web series or a feature film. But most importantly, their work is created outside of a larger parent company's ownership. This means they operate and distribute their work without the involvement of larger conglomerates, like Disney, Warner, and Sony, for example. Indie short films and movies have existed since the dawn of filmmaking, but really rose to prominence as a counterpoint to movies and short films being released by major studios during the rise of the Hollywood system. In the case of someone like Don Bluth, he left Walt Disney Productions due to creative differences, wanting to create his own passion projects with fewer of the restrictions imposed on him by Disney, through, ironically, hiring a group of other disgruntled employees who left with him. Many indie animation productions before the internet were done in a wide variety of mediums, like stop motion, cut paper, and claymation. However, the history of indie animation online that we know today has a more recent history. The rise of the internet throughout the 90s, leading to the mass adoption of broadband throughout the 2000s, democratized animation, like it democratized pretty much everything else. Prior to that, if you wanted to get into indie animation, you had to start doing your own research and go to local events. Seminars, conventions, art festivals, networking conferences, film festivals. In-person meetups were some of the best resources you had to try and find like-minded folks who wanted to get involved with your project. But you had to be highly proactive and usually live in a fairly big city to find a wide array of events to check out. But that all changed with the rapid expansion of the internet, where unlimited global reach became the default. By the early 2000s, websites like Newgrounds and YouTube and studios like Frederator made a lasting impact by creating opportunities that completely changed the landscape and started to affect the direction of the industry. Multiple technologies all reached a new level of maturity at the same time that created a perfect storm for a new wave of animation unlike anything that came before it. Now, indie creators had a chance to expose their work to a massive audience, without restrictions and, more importantly, without needing to ask permission. Now, the early animation scene on Newgrounds was usually pretty crass, sure, but it was in response to the corporate mandate that animation was strictly a children's medium. Now, we all know that's obviously false, as not only were adults creating it, but they loved it as an art form. If you had Windows Movie Maker, a pirated version of Adobe Flash, and most importantly, a dream, then you could start making your own homegrown animated cartoons. Early web animation was a celebration of this niche by taking that content to almost an absurdist degree, pushing animation into taboo territory far beyond what most normal people had ever experienced. Rubber Ninja and Eagle Raptor, also known as Ross O'Donovan and Aaron Hansen, are two examples of creators that we know today that got their start animating in Flash and making parody cartoons on Newgrounds. Other early animators like Harry Partridge and Psychic Pebbles also uploaded their videos to YouTube, since it had tons of traffic. But these videos would usually have some kind of censoring to get past YouTube's content moderation. During the credits, they'd encourage the viewer to go watch their other stuff on Newgrounds as well since the video quality of a native Flash project looked way better there than the compressed video on YouTube at the time. Not to mention their more lax approach towards language, violence, and nudity. You won't find them on YouTube. They were meant to be seen on Newgrounds.com. Click that link on the right to go watch them how they were meant to be seen. Crystal clear without all this fuzzy compression bullshit. The platform was a massive boon for early online indie animation but they were really limited by things like file size, quality, and upload limits. 
computers of the time could only handle a fraction of the computational power we expect from them today. So the scope of projects possible on your personal laptop or desktop were still a far cry from what a professional studio could do with high-end specialized workstations. YouTube gave animators a platform to reach more people and bring an already existing following to the website in a larger way than had been done before. For the first few years of YouTube existing, it had strict limits on file size and total video length, capping off at 10 minutes. Those were dark times, trust me. Plus, you were randomly assigned a thumbnail image from a frame in the video. You couldn't even upload your thumbnail at the time. But as far as video length limits go, it would not have been possible to upload an entire episode of something like Hell of a Boss in one go. Cutting up a longer former animation into smaller chapters was the standard to work within YouTube's limitations. So if you were there to experience it, <laughs> congratulations! You also qualify for the senior special discount. I'll see you at the old kitchen buffet. Now, one of the biggest animated short channels during the early years of YouTube was Mondo Media. They helped produce dozens of short-run miniseries from the late 2000s into the late 2010s. But they were best known for two highly popular standouts. Happy Tree Friends, featuring cute Care Bear-like animals being horribly dismembered and killed in freak accidents. And then Dick Figures, The Misadventures of Red and Blue. Two polar opposite stick figure best friends. Now, most of these shorts were under three to five minutes long and were animated in Adobe Flash, giving them a slick but clean aesthetic. But you can't talk about the history of indie web animation without talking about independent companies like Frederator, who paved the way for longer form narrative web series to take off. Frederator was founded in 1997 by cartoonist Fred Seibert with a goal to help produce creator-driven animated shows. If you're an animation fan, you've probably watched at least some of their animated pilots that later evolved into full TV shows, including Fairly Odd Parents, My Life as a Teenage Robot, Chalk Zone, and of course... But Frederator could not be contained by just television. They rapidly made the transition to digital platforms, starting with video podcast in 2005 but they would get a leg up by launching a new media company at the right place at the right time. In 2011, Google launched the YouTube Original Channel Initiative program. After newly acquiring YouTube in a purchase deal, Google decided to create a $100 million fund to provide grants to channels and creators to make original, high-quality content unique to YouTube. With that, Frederator was selected to receive some of the funding from that program. By 2012, they began using a similar model of corralling together various creators that they had in the past and helped produce their animated series concepts under one company umbrella, the Channel Frederator Network. But this time, they would be posted on YouTube under their independent animation channel dubbed Cartoon Hangover. Cartoon Hangover was designed to serve as a hub for online independent animation and used that funding to develop new shows. It was the online home of Frederator's biggest web series hit at the time, Bravest Warriors, a goofy action series created by Pendleton Ward, the same guy behind Adventure Time. But it also included another outlier, a short from their Too Cool Cartoons incubation program that proved to be so popular, it would later on to get its own web series, Bee and Puppycat. Now, was all this just because these shows were just that memorable and entertaining? Mm, yeah, kind of. As a series, Bravest Warriors was a big hit out the gate, with a simplistic visual style, fun writing, and a merch line, complete with shirts, spin-off comics, and cute cat bug plush toys. Being Puppy Cat also quickly blew up on their channel. It had one of the most successful animation Kickstarter campaigns of all time to turn Bee and Puppycat from a small YouTube incubator hit into a full-fledged online series. The Kickstarter launched on October 15th, 2013, and would go on to raise nearly $900,000 in a month, beating their original goal of $600,000. This funded nine episodes of the show, and was the most successful animation Kickstarter ever. Well, before being dethroned by Critical Role's Kickstarter for Vox Machina in 2019. 
Sorry guys, uh, you can't beat D&D fans, they're just way too competitive and organized. Both Bravest Warriors and Bee and Puppy Cat went on to develop a massive online fan base on websites like Tumblr, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Folks all over the world were sharing memes, making costumes, creating fan art, and posting their favorite clips to encourage other people online to check it out. But animation is not cheap. Even with funding from one of the biggest companies in the world, YouTube would eventually end the original channel initiative a year later, meaning a large chunk of Frederator's funding was cut off. Now, there's a lot more to the story for Frederator's past, but if you want to know more about their downfall, Check out my What Ruined Bravest Warriors video. Let me tell you, that story is a doozy. But aside from bigger projects, many YouTube animators were making shorts and parodies on a smaller scale, creating an environment that allowed independent animators to thrive. But this isn't to say YouTube has always been a haven for animators. <laughs> Far from it, YouTube is notorious for changing their policies regarding how monetization works for users. In March of 2012, they changed to a minutes watched model because of the rising issue of Reply Girls, which is lazy reply content made to game the algorithm of larger, more popular videos for monetization by abusing content tags. But this small change from YouTube led to a big change in the animation community. Watch time is a critical component of getting better returns on monetization from your content. However, most animated videos on YouTube in the early 2010s were generally shorter, uploaded less frequently, and took substantially longer to make. So their monetization was destroyed by this new policy as a side effect. To combat this, more animators became reliant on Patreon or partnering up with bigger networks to make money. Now, a new form of indie animation sprung out from this limitation, storytime videos. They even became more popular, feeling like accessible and relatable vlog content with a limited animation twist. Before we can answer the thesis for our video, we have to better understand the origins of indie animation. Some of the biggest creators creating storytime animations today got their start back then, including Swoozy, Jaden Animations, Domix, and the Odd Ones Out, just to name a few. Their channels are still highly popular, with exceptional visual quality, but they built their way up to this point, eventually being able to hire a large team to craft their videos, ensuring they meet the standards of their channel but there were still some standout channels being run by only a few people, dividing up the animation work to create their own series, using themselves as the lead characters. Ed's World is a well-known example, being made by three friends, Ed Gould, Thomas Tom Scott Ridgewell, and Matt Hargreaves. They had developed a devoted fan base, especially within the UK. And after Ed had passed away from his battle with cancer in March of 2012, Tom and Matt kept the channel going in honor of Ed's memory. Other channels would sink most of their resources into high-quality visuals. From both a 3D and 2D perspective, there's Meta Runner, a sci-fi cyberpunk web series that had a long-form serialized plot since its inception in July of 2019. It had funding as a joint venture between Screen Australia, AMD, Crunchyroll, and Epic Games. This provided enough capital for three seasons and was the original signature series for Glitch. And we can't forget about your boy, Hunter Hancock, better known as Meat Canyon. His videos are both gorgeously animated but visually grotesque, which is a bold choice for YouTube of all places, but admittedly a very refreshing change of pace. To keep with a regular upload schedule, Hunter works with his team of remote animators to get projects from concept to a completed video roughly every two weeks, funding them through his Patreon and merch sales. And I would also assume his second channel now, which is really good. So many iconic early web series came from passionate creators with a weird sense of humor, bringing their ideas to life. Homestar Runner, Salad Fingers, Madness, Batman Piderman, Happy Tree Friends, Dr. Tran, Brackenwood, basically everything on Newgrounds. 
Those projects never would have gotten the green light from a corporate media producer because they weren't safe for brands or did not fit in the traditional distribution model. Even though there was clearly an audience for a wide array of animated media, but change was on the horizon for indie animation, and the stakes were about to be that much higher. Doctor, are you sure this will work? <laughs> I have no idea! Now, things have changed substantially since the early days from a tech standpoint. Evolving digital tools have gotten more accessible, more affordable, and continue to improve the creation of indie animation. Thanks to the rapid changes in tech we enjoy today, anybody can make an animated short film with an iPad, digital stylus, drawing program, and enough patience to see it through. On the 3D side, there are freely available sculpting programs like Blender and ZBrush Core Mini, that provide a user-friendly interface for making CGI character models and worlds. These tools have lowered the barrier to entry for many budding filmmakers to try their hand at making the kind of content they've been wanting from Hollywood, but put in the work to make it happen themselves. If you have an interesting concept and some basic skills to get a project off the ground, there's bound to be an audience for it, especially if you make it easily accessible on a larger platform. Word of mouth is one of the most effective marketing tools any indie producer or developer can have. Entire fandoms can erupt out of a single episode or a short indie game because people who checked it out loved it and are excited to share their experience with the rest of the world. So I don't think it's any coincidence why indie animation is challenging the industry landscape so much. They're making more visually distinct original IPs that stick out more than what the movies have to offer. Following this, other YouTubers pivoted within the limitations of YouTube by working on larger scale projects, pilots for new series, or their own web series. And if you're subscribed to my channel, which you totally should be, press the button down below, you are already familiar with some of them. Hell of a Boss, The Amazing Digital Circus, Monkey Wrench, Long Gone Gulch, Lackadaisy, Ollie and Scoops, Godspeed, Cliffside, and that is just the tip of the iceberg on this topic. But by far, the first pilot that took the internet by storm and became a household name in the animation community was Hasbin Hotel. Yes, the one with the skinny demons. As a large man, I am offended. I'm joking. Or am I? Created by Vivzy Pop, aka Vivian Madrano, it was a 31-minute animated short film about Charlie, the Princess of Hell, opening up a rehab hotel to reform sinners and get them into heaven. A weird, edgy concept, to be sure. But it had bouncy animation, lots of swearing, adult humor, and memorable character designs. The pilot was funded mainly by Madrano's Patreon followers, taking six months to write, and two years to animate with her animation studio team at Spindle Horse, along with voiceover with the help of freelance artists. But their hard work paid off, with the pilot getting over 108 million views to date, since it was first uploaded on October 28th, 2019. The breakout success of Hasbin Hotel led to a series development deal with Amazon Prime, which premiered on January 18th, 2024. They also had help from A24 and Bento Box. This also paved the way for a follow-up web series, also produced by Spindle Horse, Hell of a Boss, which was originally released on October 31st, 2020. Each episode continues to do gangbusters with high production values, and is also freely available on YouTube. The series itself is funded by a combination of Patreon, YouTube ad rev, and their highly lucrative merchandise line. Another promising example is Lackadaisy, a pilot based on the Lackadaisy webcomic series created by Tracy J. Butler. The pilot was funded by Kickstarter in March of 2020, raising over $338,000, well past their $125,000 goal, with the pilot later premiering on YouTube on March 29th, 2023. Crowdfunding really does seem to be the most substantial way forward if you have a story to tell and you want to get it out there. And there are a lot of advantages to that. There is the pride of doing it yourself, communicating directly with supporters, along with the creative and general freedom that comes with being the one that is calling the shots. 
This is not, however, a realistic option for everybody. Both Madrano and Butler were developing their show concepts for years, even well over a decade, before getting to the point of being able to fund a well-realized project. Not everyone has a large, dedicated fan base that will donate to their cause. Even if someone is lucky enough to have some level of online recognition, funds can still be very tight for a lot of reasons. There is a lot of luck that goes into working in entertainment. Amazing concepts can fall apart if they don't have the funds to do what makes sense from a production and logistical standpoint to lift it off the ground. And one of my biggest warnings to people who want to get into this, and I know people get mad at me for saying this, but it's true, money is going to be one of your biggest barriers because unless you're paying your team poorly, which you shouldn't be, you're probably going to be paying between three to $10,000 per minute of finished animation. Wow. Like it is not cheap. While there are pros to working on your own, there are also many cons, like not being able to properly allocate your budget to the necessary scale. If this is your first time attempting to make something big, it's likely you won't know what to expect. You might underprepare or have to cut corners later down the line because you did not foresee an issue that someone with more experience would have seen. Feature creep is very real. If you're not careful, your ambition can outgrow your resources. Make sure you have a reliable team or support network who give honest but fair feedback about the scope and direction. Stay on budget, pay your team fairly, and be willing to scale things back to deliver a solid, finished work. Otherwise, you can either get stuck not making the project, making too many delays, squander your budget, or making a lackluster version of your original vision. If any of this is seeming too specific to animation, try to think of it as an indie video game. Some of the biggest titles today that became their own multi-million dollar franchise started out as simple indie games with good ideas behind them. Chances are you've played some of them or at least have heard of them. Several indie games were even developed by one person with a solid vision working within their own restrictions to make a unique but memorable experience for gamers. I'm about to say it, you know it's coming. Undertale. That is one of the best examples out there. It is a straightforward and simple RPG with catchy music, fun writing, and an original twist on typical RPG combat. That soundtrack is uh, popular, I suppose. But the entire game was programmed and developed by Toby Fox, with character design work by Timmy Chang and a few other guest artists. He made this in 32 months, with his funding coming from a Kickstarter campaign. Even if you have a very limited budget, some of the best assets you can have for any kind of indie development is flexibility, creative restrictions, and drive. Money is definitely going to be a part of it. Like, don't get me wrong. But it does not mean anything without the work ethic and the adaptability to follow through on a project. Managing a team requires a lot of maturity, direct communication, and setting realistic deadlines for yourself and your team to work within. Many AAA games are now rushed out being buggy as hell and unfinished because of arbitrary deadlines from the parent companies insisting they're released by this date, no excuses. Most developers don't want to put out a game that clearly needs more time to have all the kinks worked out but they're often beholden to the same budget restraints, strict deadlines, and marketing expectations as people working in major film studios. Sonic 06 has to be out by Christmas. Who cares if it's broken as hell and basically unplayable? Merry Christmas, Timmy. Go ahead, open your present. Now let it be known. I'm not here to say that all mainstream created films are void of passion, quality, and success. 
On the contrary, movies like Puss in Boots' The Last Wish, Into the Spider-Verse, and Encanto get a hefty amount of praise from audiences and critics alike because they're well-made films with great stories. But many animated blockbusters coming out now just aren't drawing in crowds the way they used to. Because there's no such thing as a safe bet anymore, studios might be risk-adverse and try to rely on sequels and reboots to rake in the cash. But they're also having trouble attracting new talent to want to work with them. Now, is that all surprising, considering the amount of layoffs, strikes, tax write-offs, and general amount of hostility in Hollywood these days? No, not at all. I don't blame any artists who are looking for an alternative to a studio system that chews them up and spits them out. But are there still any real benefits to working at a traditional studio? Sure, but it needs some checks and balances to make sense and be decent to work in. Let us start with the traditional route. If you are lucky enough to get your show in front of a studio that is offering big bucks to produce it, there are a few things to consider. The first is funding. This is the most obvious pro of working with a large company, and the reason this system has been in place for so long. It alleviates all of the financial burden. Marketing, distribution, production, voice actors, animators, assistants, office space, all the bells and whistles. Sure, you could try to get those things on your own, but it's an uphill battle. And not everyone has the resources to do that. If you look at a lot of the recent shows that have come out in the last 15 years, most of the showrunners came off working for other shows in a supporting role from the same network. Sometimes they can come from working as a storyboard artist on one show then become the creative developer on a new series. The talent is there, of course, but it's a lot easier to pitch ideas and get them approved when you already have your foot in the door. Now, for the rest of us, these opportunities are few and far between. And even if someone does have the chance to attend a top-tier art school, that still is not a guarantee that you'll be able to make your own show. The vast majority of people working in the industry are in the trenches, doing stuff like in-betweens and cleanup work. Now, this is not to downplay those roles, of course. They're highly technical positions and essential to a finished show, but they demand a lot of time and attention, and you generally won't have the time to work on your own ideas while on the clock. If you have characters and stories in your head that you're desperate to share with the world, going the studio route is still a gamble. It's a boring answer, sure, but funding can truly make or break a project, with or without the backing of a studio. A solo animator or small team might have a ton of talent and a brilliant concept, with concept art that could be blowing up on social media and an audience eagerly waiting to watch it. But if they're working 60 plus hours a week, juggling two jobs to make rent, you are not going to see their pilot anytime soon. And even once you can get the ball rolling, funding will continue to be one of the biggest hurdles to overcome at every point in the production. The money, Skyler, where is the rest? Skyler. Working with a company also gives you arguably two of the most important resources to be mindful of, time and focus. Instead of spreading yourself thin and having to wear a ton of hats to manage everything on production, you can focus strictly on the project, while the other jobs are allocated to their own specialized departments. Another pro to working with a company, and a major difference compared to the indie world, is having your team all in one place. Problems can be dealt with relatively quickly. While there are a lot of challenges with working in an indie space, and certainly benefits to working in a studio environment, there are things you have to pay out of pocket that some would say cost more than the time and money you might spend venturing out on your own. While companies may carry the financial burden and market risk of your show, the loss of control and ownership of your project may make this trade-off a tough choice. And with the rapid inclusion of AI in most studios these days, it's not just a creator's IP that they're after. Many specialized jobs are being eliminated for the sake of, you guessed it, money. But that capital is not going into the marketing of the film or adding to the special effects budget for the visual effects team. Uh, usually, it's been added as a bonus for people up the corporate ladder who have not had any involvement with the films they're destroying whatsoever. 
AI is not being used to combat labor shortages or to battle the increasing cost of productions. It's being used to replace artists who are already severely underpaid and overworked by an industry that does not value them. Case in point, the notorious Netflix Japan short film The Boy and the Dog, which was heavily promoted on Twitter citing their use of AI backgrounds. The developers claimed it was due to a labor shortage in Japan. But if you know anything about the anime industry overseas, it is that many Japanese animators work extremely long hours and typically live in poverty during their youth into middle age. They have an abysmal work-life balance and are paid next to nothing. Based on a vlog video by the YouTube channel Animator Dormitory, there's no consistent pay grade for Japanese animators, but on average, they earn around $670 per month. Not week, per month. Most highly detailed drawings made by in-betweeners can take an hour to draw, but they usually get 200 yen or $2 for each one. Burnout and chronic overworking is an unfortunate cultural expectation in Japan, but these working conditions should not be normalized, especially for an industry with a market value of over $20 billion a year. Where's that money going to? I guess the corporate folks. Who would have guessed? Thanks, AI. Now, budgets keep getting inflated for most new animated films these days. But if the movie itself fails to meet investor expectations, the ones lowest on the totem pole usually have to bear the brunt of the impact. Not the people who made the crappy decisions, mind you. The ones who said, let's rush this film out or scrap and rework entire sequences without accommodating for lost time. No, no, of course not. It is the creative staff who have to put up with the chronic layoffs, the work of multiple animators being consolidated onto fewer people, the crushing weight of insane deadlines. All of the burden falls on the creative team mostly. The list goes on and on and on, and the need for positive change has never been stronger. So with all these factors at work, is it any wonder why creative folks would be looking for something different? Any kind of change in the industry itself will be gradual, but it takes a lot of networking and internal motivation to make a sustainable game plan that's financially viable. The most upfront benefits of being an independent creator are that you don't have to wait for approval or permission from anyone. You can create exactly what you want, how you want to, to the best of your abilities immediately. You retain all the creative control and all the legal rights to whatever you make. Unlike in a studio setting where Disney, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Networks, Netflix, whoever else is paying the bills, well, they own everything. Not you, them. Animation is expensive enough to produce with a studio system in place, let alone independently. Sometimes a creator is offered a life-changing opportunity for managing their own show, but things eventually get mired in creative differences or being badly handled by the network itself. The company that invested in your show can just flippantly decide it's canceled, and then you're stuck in this expensive rights battle to finish your story, where a project you dedicated so much of your time and energy towards creating miraculously getting the pilot picked up by a major network, only to have it disappear in the blink of an eye. No! As an outspoken animation advocate, I cannot tell you how much it boils my blood to see artful, well-crafted shows being removed permanently. We're not even talking about traditional lost media here. These shows were straight up cut down in their prime. Olin Rogers, a YouTube comedian and the creator of Final Space at the time of recording this video, is dealing with that right now. His series had three seasons, jumping from TBS to Adult Swim to Netflix. In September of 2022, it was revealed that Final Space would be erased from Netflix in 2023 as a part of a group of properties being written off by Warner Brothers Discovery for tax purposes. Olin started the hashtag Renew Final Space, and this eventually led to WB offering him a one-time license to publish a physical graphic novel for the Final Space ending. The power of online communities is strong, but still, in the face of big companies with contracts and lawyers, 
It is a harsh reality, knowing that the thing you built can be swept under the table to save a few bucks. Olin said, quote, five years of my life, three seasons of TV, blood, sweat, and tears, became a tax write-off for the network who owns Final Space. End quote. Having to sacrifice some creative choices to please executives can be brutal. But in some cases, it can just mean adding jokes that are in bad taste. Sometimes they make demands to cater the humor towards a certain demographic, and you have to pick your battles. Olin Rogers confirmed in Final Space that working with the studio executives, there were bits in the show he did not want to have, like the infamous piss fight in the episode called The Happy Place. Olin gave in so that he could fight bigger battles down the line, but he confirmed on the Reddit AMA that he was not a fan of this bit. Long story short, executives wanted harder jokes that pushed the envelope. We pitched the joke as a bit, never intending to use it, but they end up liking it so much, they wanted it used, hence us using it. It did get us out of a rough patch though with the head of the network. Lesson here, don't pitch jokes you don't want to use. End quote. The next generation of animators entering the industry are likely going to be distrustful of working with these major companies. And honestly, yeah, they should be. For a lot of artists, giving their creations away for a check is not the expected standard it used to be. Success on the web is clearly possible now, without a studio as the middleman warping a production into a shell of its former self. But that knowledge gives them all the more reason to recognize the value of their shows and to not compromise on sanitizing the brand of a show due to corporate interference. There was a period of time where we were actually um, pitching murder drones to, to, to studios and just a quick TLDR, we're going completely indie now, we are not pitching to studios anymore. Um, but there was a period of time for, for about a year where I was uh, doing a bunch of pitch meetings with like a bunch of streaming services, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. There was a meeting and this will capture my entire experience in one example. The guy was like, murder drones, it's a bit, bit too much of a violent name. Can you change it to like meta drones? I heard meta is pretty, the word meta is pretty big right now. What the Working with studios clearly has its ups and downs in terms of compromises. Some showrunners end up getting more creative freedom and control on their projects. But like many jobs, it's down to how good the management is. Adult Swim Smiling Friends is a recent and popular example, created by Zach Hadel and Michael Cusack. They are two YouTubers who got their start on Newgrounds as animators and gradually developed a dedicated following of fans. Now, Adult Swim is well known for giving off-the-wall show concepts a chance lest we forget about Xavier. And the runaway success of Smiling Friends demonstrates that at least some networks are willing to not leave every creative decision up to a committee. As we have seen from all the high quality pilots that have been dropping recently, indie animation has not shown any signs of slowing down. But major studios have definitely noticed the impact. But rather than learning from seeing which stories and IP connect with the viewers, they just keep doing the same thing they've always done. Offer up enough money to buy the property. As popular as the Has Been Hotel Prime series was after it premiered, by far the biggest complaint viewers had online was that it felt rushed and had too much story condensed into eight episodes. Now, I do agree with that sentiment, but I also get why it happened. It's lame and I hate it, but this seems to be just a bad company policy. Any new IP for a streaming service is going to be a risk, even with a fan base as loyal as Viv's. And for a company as big as Amazon, this episode order just seems to be a weird pattern for them. As they did the same thing with Invincible and The Boys, two of their most popular shows on the service. I, I don't know, I'm trying to make it make sense here. When you have a built-in fan base, that's a pretty good selling point in itself. A lot of creators do so much of the heavy lifting when it comes to gathering support for a show, before a studio even has to step in. This has been a trend across the board in entertainment, and it makes sense. From TikTok musicians signing onto major labels and YouTubers getting book deals, having a dedicated fan base is one of the most effective ways to market yourself. 
Now, one thing I would personally love to see would be YouTube fostering a better environment for these productions to really make a bigger dent in the entertainment landscape. Now, I know they've been busy in the past year, pandering to brands in an extreme way, and let's be honest here, uh, <laughs> uh, enabling good old-fashioned cyberbullies. But a part of me wants to believe YouTube management really could make a sincere attempt to help these creators out, with stuff like financial grants or promotional campaigns, as they're providing actual high-quality content onto their platform. From a business perspective, it would really make sense. Most people my age and younger watch pretty much everything online these days, most notably YouTube. They could be targeting a younger, tech-savvy demographic who are looking for something new and notable to check out. Not television, who watches that? But given their track record, I doubt how realistic this possibility is, despite the many challenges presented when attempting to work in an indie space. There are still many people doing it. There is something about this space that allows people to tell their stories in their own way with their own voice. And while the production pipelines may be trickier, it seems to be worth it. I believe this trend will continue as long as there is a path to profit, which many creators on the scene are aware of and actively utilizing. They're following through with their complete vision for a project. They're hopefully paying their teams well for their efforts and releasing new material on a regular but realistic basis to build up the hype for the finished production. It'll be out when it's out, and we like that. It'll be out when it's out. People are excited about indie animation because it just breeds and feeds on passion. There are so many creators in this generation that are excited to push it forward, and I do not see that momentum stopping anytime soon. I just want people to make great animation. And that's the whole point of this, okay? It's, it's just have fun, make things, and dare to fail. In conclusion, the reason indie animation keeps growing is because now more than ever, the tools and the means to make it happen are more accessible than ever before. In a world that is opening up to AI technology, it's refreshing to see that audiences are still supporting genuine storytelling, actual craftsmanship, and passion projects made by real creators. Art made by people for people. That is the beauty and appeal of indie animation. People are not only excited to participate, but see where it's going and help the next generation to really show how far the impact of indie animation can reach. Episode one of The Amazing Digital Circus was at over six million views just after two days of being uploaded, with merch tie-ins ready to help fund the show. And after only six months, it has become the most watched indie animated pilot in YouTube's entire history, hitting a whopping 310 million views and climbing. Also, at the time of recording this video, the second episode of Digital Circus was released, and it easily cleared 30 million views within 24 hours. That is outstanding. Also, the pilot itself is not just a remarkable piece of animation, but it's also a marvel of marketing accessibility. Not only was Digital Circus freely available on YouTube, but it was released with 18 different language dubs. And crazier still, no foul language. <laughs> now for the record, that is not a dunk on has -been Hotel or Hell of a Boss. But I cannot stress enough how big of a difference that makes for branching out your audience. We have the numbers to prove it, along with some uh, <laughs> seriously terrifying bootleg Halloween costumes as well. I guess that is just the price of success. What the f am I looking at? The consequences of our actions. From the start, it was automatically more accessible across the world and relatively family friendly making it a huge hit with adults and kids alike. If a success story like that does not make the Hollywood industry bat an eye, then they are dangerously insulating themselves from real progress and innovation. I think more independent creators are going to continue this trend, and we will see an era of animation dominated by storytellers and talent, 
that were cultivated through online spaces. From where I'm sitting, it looks like the future of indie animation is bright. Animation that is being celebrated and supported by fans. And they are adamantly showing up, supporting creators every step of the way. It is absolutely wild to see how far indie animation has come and how influential it has become. Now, despite the obvious passion this community has and the support being thrown, the future is still a mystery. There are so many places uncertainty can creep in, from financial stress to contracts sealing your creation behind a vault. But despite all of that, artists persist. We keep creating and keep pushing the medium forward. And I believe that the trends we are seeing now will continue to force innovation until Hollywood cannot ignore it any longer. Until the industry actually recognizes the passion and talent that goes into making better art and media instead of marketable products, they'll keep making these same mistakes and wasting more money to get worse results. Competition like this should be keeping them on their toes and hopefully learning to value and appreciate, taking calculated risk, again, led by passion. But at the end of the day, I'm just glad to be along for the ride for this one because the scenery is truly something else and it gives me hope for the future of animation.